Hello, we're going to try again. We've just been live once. Apparently it didn't work. Boys and girls, we're going to give it another try. Hannah looks like she's looking to the heavens for answers, but I think she's watching Dave. I'm Is looking at Dave. Is anybody Are on? Are see us? Are we on? <laughs> <laughs> I love this so technical. Oh, we're oh. We're sorted. We're sorted. Yes. Okay. Hello. Welcome to Monday. It's due to the shit. Today we are talking about the gender pay gap. Um, or, uh, the gender pay gap is the gap between what women and men are paid in the workplace. So in May of this year, it marked 50 years since the introduction of the Equal Pay Act, when it was made law that women had to be paid the same amount as men for uh, a, a work, uh, a job of equal amount of work and responsibility. But according to the latest statistics from the uh, Gender Pay Gap report, uh, women are still paid 20% less than men in the UK. So that's what we're going to talk about today, girls. Very exciting. Hannah. Yeah, hello. Have you been paid less than a man for doing the same job? Yeah, but I don't want to talk about it. There <laughs> <laughs> was all the goss before, but now she won't. <laughs> no, no, there wasn't. And then, um, yeah, I have, um, well, not doing the exact same job, but the same position, same level of responsibility. Um, less experience, but more qualifications. Right, okay. Um, what sector was that in? Um, I don't education. want to say. Oh, okay. This is great chat. Uh, yeah, it's happened, but we're not going to say you yeah, have. We're not talking about it. We can't talk about it. Marisha, have you ever paid, been paid less than a man? No, I, I don't know, in all honesty. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I think um, what my last employment, um, it was, um, there was another guy that was there at the same time, joined at the same time. We had very different skill sets and very different, um, you know, brought different things to the business. Um, but actually the you know, boss at the time, female boss, uh, was very hot on making sure that we got the same because we both input, you know, differently to the business but to its success you know we, we bought um you know different skills um so that may well have changed you know and i didn't know about it um you know and there's there's all sorts of things i guess around that um but yeah not that i know so uh, how about well, you rachel well, you see, I don't know either. I, I used to work at the NHS. I worked at the NHS for about eight or nine years. Um, and that was really the only place that I could compare. Obviously, I had jobs before that, but they were mainly jobs in bars and uh, garages and stuff where you just got paid an hourly rate. I'm fairly sure there I was paid the same amount as, as, as the men that were there. Um, but yeah, at the NHS, I don't know, because the thing is, it's, it's so tricky, isn't it? It's not, you can't just say, I'm a woman and I'm a man and he's getting paid more than me. There's so many things wrapped up into that. As you say, it's level of experience, it's years in the role, it's, it's you know, are you working full-time or part-time? And that's why it's really tricky for women to be able to measure this. Well, interesting you should say that, Rachel, because um, the measure of the gender pay gap is about, the level of jobs across the whole of the UK, like like it's it's specified full time or um all other, but it doesn't look at men and women doing the same role. It just looks on a whole, a women paid less than men, and on a whole, women are paid seventeen point eight percent less than men. Which means that it might not be that they're doing the they if, if they're doing the same job, there might be equal pay, but it indicates that there's less opportunities in management for women or uh, less opportunities at any kind of executive level or in the higher paid industries or they're doing less full-time work or um you know it's kind of a bigger picture so to say it's like for like is it simplifies it and i think often that's an argument that's used by people who say that the gender pay gap doesn't exist or mm -hmm. you know not an it's a non-issue because Oh, you know, women have got less, like that. That woman has got less experience than that man for doing the same job, or you can't compare the two jobs or whatever. So, I think it is an important distinction that it is just on the whole. 
but that's why it's really hard to measure isn't it because as yeah. an individual you don't know and you can't say and you can't go in and say well i was doing the same job as that man and therefore i got and i got paid less therefore it's discrimination that's why it's so dangerous and ins insipid because you you can never kind of pinpoint it and say i should have been paid more because if you put them you know there is the equal pay act in place if you put exactly the same job side by side chances are you would be being paid the same but it's all of those other elements that come in so individual women never know how to question this or how to challenge it and like not many people know what their colleagues are being paid yeah and that's not thing. many employers look favorably upon people discussing their salaries and where i've worked in the past it has caused massive issues when when employee employees start to discuss their salaries between themselves not because of any discrimination but just because um everyone thinks they, sh they should be paying more all the time but do, you, do you think so do you not think that this is or, uh, and this is a question do you think this is a particularly british thing that we don't talk about money and it's quite rude to start having conversations about money and that then plays into kind of the employer's hands I don't know, Marisha. Would you would you talk? Would you start a conversation with your colleagues, Marisha, where you you ask them outright how much were they paid? I don't I don't know if I would, you know, because I, I don't. Yeah, I mean, to to answer the question, I guess you know, is it a British thing? Then yeah, I think it is, but it's broader than than you know wages. I think people don't really have the money conversations in general, um, you know, to do with all sorts of things. And I could go off on a rant about you know that they should kind of these conversations should actually start in school. Do you know what I mean? That you know people need to you know, be aware of all this all this stuff to do with money that we just don't learn, um, but. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I would. Um, and yeah, I, I agree. I think there's the, you know, it's almost that we don't talk about it, isn't it? You know, you don't mm. ask how much somebody's on. Uh, it's just not top of, of conversation and it would be rude to ask. So, yeah, yeah. My, my old lecturer at university, she used to have a, a poster in her uh, in her office, which was, I think, the Department of Work and Pensions poster, actually. But it, it said uh, there was two, two a, boy, a little boy and a little girl. And she said, prepare your daughter for working life. Pay her less pocket money than your son. Mm. And you're absolutely right. You know, these are conversations. We, we don't teach children about money in school. I think, you know, a long time ago, I'm fairly sure that girls used to have housekeeping lessons within school. It was part of home economics. And that's why it was called home economics, because they would learn how to uh, responsibly look after the housekeeping money that their husbands would generously give to them. And that was something that, that girls were taught, that sort of financial responsibility. But obviously, it, that grew out of fashion as we started to be slightly less sexist. But as a result, we don't teach any children about money and about how to have those conversations and about what their value is either, do we? We do. So I was a careers advisor and there are elements like there are parts of that curriculum that kind of wrap around supportive employee employee ability curriculum that um, does talk about the the earning potential in jobs um, and, you know, kind of top and bottom, depending on your levels of experience. And there is financial health and well-being kind of lessons and teaches you how to budget and how to read a pay slip and how to open a bank account and stuff. But it's not compulsory. So it depends on the level of it depends on how engaged the school is. I know in Rotherham, when I was working in that sector, primary school and secondary school and college was like across the borough were shit hot on it. Like they were really good. And I think that's because um, it's quite a a quite a deprived borough and um, what so, age children were those though that, that were learning that was that high school kids or college you know, all primary up to post 16. all right okay so yeah. that's quite interesting yeah because i don't remember ever learning anything about money at school no. i don't remember that ever being on the curriculum no they used to do a lot of enterprise curriculum so setting up kind of small enterprises and managing a budget and things like that and working out how much money they had to spend on you know profit and loss and things like that from really really tiddler you know kind of year three year two up and up um, and yeah. I think the funding got cut for a lot of it to be fair I remember doing that I remember doing young enterprise and uh, that was at high school. school yeah yeah I did that in high yeah, school I don't know. did you do anything like that Marisha any kind of no, no. 
Not at all. No, it yeah. was. No, I Where didn't. Did you go? Lincoln. Me, no, Leicester. Leicester, show. Leicester sorry. I knew it began with an L. It's all the same place. Lincoln. Somewhere <laughs> in the middle. We're going with L. That doesn't yeah. say. <laughs> Where they talk for you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, we didn't do it, but it's interesting. And in like the careers advice as well for the kids are getting these days. I think it's interesting that they are showing um an unbias towards gender, generally speaking. There's pockets of horrendous sexism, but they do show children what the what the value of each role is and how much they can expect to earn within each role. Like the National Careers Service has got a really good database. So like if you were wanting to have those conversations with your kid or whatever, have a look at the National Careers Service. Um, I think it's important. It's the conversations we need yeah. to have. But again, we come back to that that point of, you know, we, we, we don't tend to discuss it. And employers, big employers, don't want people to have, you know, it's even down to you get your wage slip, don't you? In you know, it's in a sealed little thing with that dotted line that you have to like, kind of given out secretly so that we don't discuss what each other gets paid. And I know in the NHS we have bands and that, you know, there was there was there was a, a few thousand pounds between the bottom of band D and the, the top of band D. And then, you know, same again with with the other one. So you knew you, you knew what you know, I knew most of the, the med sex that I was in with were on a, a band D or a band C, but exactly what they were being paid within that, you still had no idea. So it's there's a lot of secrecy about it. I think so, it's more I think it's more endemic depending on the sector as well. Like I read an article the other week and I actually think we discussed it on here about um the raising a the last a, a study and I use the term in the loosest fucking sense had found that the gender pay gap was because women, uh, young girls were less ambitious than men. Um, oh my God. I know, um, and it was just like the most fucking ridiculous thing you've ever read. Who did that? Misogynist.co.uk. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, it was on the BBC though. And anyway, sorry, just to say, and it was saying that in certain sectors, we talked about it, certain sectors like retail, kind of entry level jobs is is predominantly women and then uh, management level and up is all men, is all men so you are yeah. going to have a disparity between the pay but that's not because you know the the people that are on the shop floor deserve or not deserve but should be on the same amount of money as the people that are taking all the weight but just because routes into that sector are, are less, it generally weighs itself more to, towards kind of women working part time around the childcare, and that's the root of the problem. That it's the the like disparity and the inequality in in society as a whole that contribute to the gender pay gap, rather than the actual amount of money that people are getting in their envelope every week. Mm -hmm. So you have led me perfectly onto my next question, which was exactly that. It is that some people have said that actually we shouldn't even call it a gender pay gap because it's not it's nothing to do with wages and the amount a woman versus a man is getting paid. What we should call it is a motherhood gap because actually it's the fact that um, that women are, you know, they're entering the workplace at the same level as men and at the same age, they're coming out of college or university or whatever and going into the workplace on those starting roles. But whereas men just keep working and keep climbing, women have five, 10, 15 years off from about the age of 25 because they're having children. And, and you know, even if the, there's women who go back full time, but they still have those caring responsibilities. So they might leave early and, they, you know, they don't stay as late at night in order to climb the greasy ladder uh, or the women go back part time or they don't go back at all and they have a complete career gap and so at the age in those mid-20s where the men are continuing to go up and up and get those higher wages and those better jobs the women are kind of staying where they are so they will still be in fairly low level or entry level jobs by the time that they're in their, their 30s and 40s and then they haven't obviously got as long to, to catch up with the men and that's actually what the gender pay gap is it's nothing to do with disparity of payment it's to do with disparity of opportunity discuss i think it goes deeper than motherhood though i think it's not exclusive to women who are mothers i think a, there is a thing about raising aspirations in girls um, and there's a thing about confidence in girls um and their own self-belief that actually they can go to university to some of the top universities and do an engineering degree 
you know, there's there's a lot of men or boys wouldn't even consider their own abilities or feel, you know, unconfident about their own abilities or their experiences. Whereas generally speaking, um, and this is a sweeping generalization, that's why I said generally speaking. <laughs> Which women, we're quite good at. Yeah, no. <laughs> women sometimes feel less competent um, or confident in their own abilities and um, feel like the workplace is not necessarily tailored to, to their specific set of skills like we were talking about the other week about um, it's not that women should be more like men it's that the workplace should tailor itself to adapt to both sets both kind of nurturing and bolshy skill sets of men and women equally yeah I agree. I do agree with you. And, uh, you know, we've got a, a session coming up on imposter syndrome and that kind of confidence that women like, haven't we? Um, but I think it is undeniable, still, you haven't convinced me otherwise, that, that women going off to have babies causes that, that cut in the career. Oh, because I do think. Yeah, no, I think it's the only thing. Yeah, no, it's not the only thing. No, I mean, have you seen that, Marisha? Have you seen, you know, women dropping out of the workplace in order to go and have children and then entering at a lower level? Or do you think it's getting less? Um, I think it'd be it'd be too easy to say, yeah, it's less. I think, you know, I, I agree with Hannah. I mean, as um, it's as it is about that, it's, it's about workplace culture and what's expected of people. And, yeah. you know, is expected you know if we're going for sweeping generalizations which we we love to do you know <laughs> but it's, it's expected that that males or men or, or you know that particular kind of um i don't know role um they carry on working and someone else comes off you know takes time off to be at home and you know with kids and stuff like that so but on the flip side you know it's it's making the 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 workplace more flexible for both parties, which it yes. does cater for. So that's why this kind of stuff happens. And the thing is, the problem is that, it, you know, we have put legislation in place over the last few years that has actually, uh, you know, is supposed to encourage this. But the harder bit of that is changing that mindset. I know, you know, when, when Leon was born 10 years ago, Dally had a week off on paternity leave and Leon and I were in intensive care for that first week so by the time we got home his paternity leave was up he was back at work he was working in Manchester in quite a, a, a competitive industry and it was expected that he would be in the office from uh, you know eight till six so he was out the house at six o'clock in the morning not getting back till eight o'clock at night so I essentially did the first few years of of Leon being a baby with, with Dali not being there and that's so damaging. But it wasn't that he wasn't allowed to take that time. He would have been allowed and he would have been allowed to have time off if Leon was ill and he would have been allowed to take an extra week after we got out of intensive care. But it was just frowned upon. And the people he worked with would make comments about, you know, oh, you, why can't your wife do it? And what, you're going home now? And what do you mean you need to be home for tea time? So, you know, well, whilst we've put the legislation in place to try and have this equality of parenting, and, and it isn't just parenting either, is it? It is, you know, caring roles. It's looking after the older generation as well as the younger generation. How do we encourage men and encourage that type of culture where men are allowed to take an equal amount of paternity leave or go home if a child is sick or take their mother to the doctors if they need it? I think a lot of it is the individual attitude of the man as well like i know that dave would have not many farms maybe now because obviously grow traffic is our business and he still has an employer but not many qualms about you know i can't do this now is ill you need to come home and you know sort out our daughter i think a lot of the thing with paternity leave and shared parental leave comes down to who is the higher earner and in many cases that's still the man and if you want to take shared parental leave you're going to have the person that's earning the most going to work and the person that's earning the least staying at home with the child you know looking after the child and uh if the man is earning more which they typically are then that in itself is a gender bias isn't it yeah. it is um have you seen this marisha because again you're working quite a male dominated industry what 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 do you think the reception would be if if you had you know a man that was saying right i'm going to go home because i need to put my child to bed do you think that would be received or 
Um, no, I don't, I don't think it is still. I think it's, and that's, that's you know, another topic, isn't it, about the toxic masculinity because that's yeah it plays into that space because, you know, if I think you, you would say, you know, if, if you put a, a job role out there, um, I'm not sure, you know, what would be the, the reception, I guess, if you got a load of, of men um, that responded to that, you know, it, it's, it's just expected, you know, and assumes that it's going to be a female that requires a part time mm-hmm. role, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't think, I don't think it would be, you know, I don't know, outwardly frowned upon, but, you know, there's, uh, you don't have to say anything sometimes, do you, you know, to kind of feel different or, you know, yeah, there's something to be highlighted. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, on the we, we time, had, I also feel for, for those guys that feel that they can't, you know, yeah. they are missing out on all sorts of things Massively. that they don't want to, uh, you know, because they feel that they have to fit into a role or into a space as well. Um, so I think there's, there's an awful lot to be done for just making it acceptable. Um, you know, for people to have lives outside of fucking work, that's what it comes down to. It's not yeah, it's just right. about work, is it? We have lives too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I remember when, when I was, when Leon was probably about, I think he was about two ish, and I got meningitis and was taken into hospital. And I was really, really poorly, you know, and in Jackson's. Um, and again, Dali wasn't allowed any time off. It was, there was, I think there was something going on, like some sort of expo or something. Um, and, and he just, it was really frowned upon. So he didn't, he didn't come and see me at all I was in there for a week and I think I saw him twice for five minutes um, and his mum had to do most of the child care of Leon and my mum and stuff um, and it's just absolutely crackers isn't it you think what world are we living in where you're not allowed to take time off to look after your own child because your wife's in hospital um, and again it's it, you know it, it I suppose we could say it's quite easy to say well it just takes one man to stand up and say i'm going to do that but it's not it's that whole culture and like I say it's not a direct thing it's an insipid kind of oh well you know oh well he's gone he's gone early obviously he's not committed to this right well in that case let's give it to such and such a body because they're still here working at nine o'clock i think though it's important that each one man stands up and says do you know what i don't care that we've got an expo and my wife's got meningitis or whatever like we have to do that for ourselves we have to stand up and say look my child is sick i'm going home uh you know my work will get done or whatever or even like you and i rachel taking our kids to meetings with us or you know we always say we are we have children and the children come along and and that is part of you know you work with grow traffic and you expect that there might be children in meetings and we'll tell you if there are but they're not going to do any harm you know, we have, we have, as women and mothers, have to stand up for ourselves and say, this is what it's going to be. Like, I've been in positions where it would have been so easy for me to say, I can't, I can't actually come and get Naya from school, even though she's sick, or I can't come and collect her because, you know, work is important. But the kid is important as well. And I think we make those sacrifices. And it's not always... I don't know. Is it ju- is it just the strength of character thing that the men have to be able to say, "Fuck it, I'm going home. My kid is ill. My wife is ill, or whatever. Like I'm needed at home," and just one by one chip away at that culture rather than just expecting it, uh, accepting it. I do. I agree. I do think that needs to be a point, but I, I do think it's not always, you know, just a, a kind of weakness of character because that you there is that weakness of character. No, no, no. no change comes from individuals standing up for themselves and yeah, that's how you change are. the culture of your workforce by saying i don't give a shit if you're going to whisper behind my back i have to go and do this because this is more important than people you know looking down on me and actually i know that that the law is on my side and i have the right to go and look after this or finish early or work my out or whatever mm-hmm. um, and just having the bollocks to stand up to it it does have to come from management, I think, as well, though, because there is that, you know, and it, it's a very, I think it's a justified fear that that men think, well, you know, uh, yes, all right, on this occasion, I'm going to go home. But what if that project is then given to somebody else? What if, you know, because I've missed that meeting, that piece of work is now allocated or somebody else coming up? And I think this particularly happens to men who are slightly older 
you know, they look at what's coming up the line and think, right, I have to be here. I have to be here consistently. And we're back to presenteeism, which we've talked about, um, because I don't want, you know, the, the young whippersnapper to steal my job or get yeah, in there. Yeah, but it's for women. How is it any different for women? A woman gets the first, you, oh, know, no, no. You, get, you get a phone call that says your kid's sick, you need to come and pick them up. We have the same, especially if you're ambitious, we have the exact same considerations. Like, oh, you know, someone else is going to, get the presentation or get the kudos or I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to get put, pulled into HR because my absences are too high because my kid's always sick or whatever. But you have to make that sacrifice and you have to stand up for yourself. And um, I don't think the cult, I think it's probably slightly more forgiving for women. It's more accepted mm. that, that you might have to leave early. But that's to our detriment as well because then they're thinking, oh, well, you know, don't employ a woman who's 25 because she's going to be going off and having kids soon or no, yeah. it's, I don't think it's, I personally don't think it's great to just say that's the culture for men and, and not say that's the culture for women and it's just as damaging for women as it is for men and not put the onus on the individual men to, to actually say, no, this is my priority. I'm going home. You won't collapse without me. I will do the work at home or whatever. Mm. No, I agree with you. You're absolutely right. Can you tell Hannah's on the verge of giving birth? She's getting quite cross today, isn't she? No, I'm not cross. <laughs> I'm very aggressive. Right? Wow. Can you smile more, please? Can you smile? <laughs> be funnier and I'll smile more. <laughs> um, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. No, you're absolutely right. It is, and and it, that's the problem, isn't it? The problem is that we have this tendency to say, to accept that women are going to have to go home and look after children and look after grandparents and parents, and we make excuses for men. And, and you know, how do we, uh, apart from just saying, well, men have got to stand up for themselves, you know, how, how do we encourage, how do we actually make men have the ability to say that? You know, we've enshrined it in law and nothing's changed. How do we change those cultures? Is It, it needs to be a bottom-up thing, but it needs to be a top-down thing as well, doesn't it? Mm. It does. I guess it's, it's you know, kind of what we've been saying, you know, on, on other conversations as well, is that it requires does require change from attitudes and from the people that are, you know, either taking over businesses, you know, to coming into those roles of influence, however that may be, you know, for act to actually do that. And I think a lot of it just requires some, some communication. You know, mm. there's, people don't fucking talk these days about stuff. And, you know, to make it work, um, you know, you, you have to communicate and you have to have conversations and, and yeah, they might be complicated and yeah, they might be difficult. And you might not, as you know, as an employee, you might not always be able to fulfill every single need and requirement from, you know, a team member and, and the staff. Um, but if you have an open conversation as opposed to just ignoring it and pretending and, and going for the, well, that's the way it's always been, then that's, you know, there's never going to be any change until then. Um, so I think, you know, the only way is to, is to educate now to, to think about it. I think the reality is, is people don't even think about it. You know, yeah. it's, it's just accepted. It's just how things are. It's just how it's always been. Um, it is. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah, we do. We don't question it. Do you think that um, what's happened over the past five, six months with, with COVID, do you think that will have had any impact on it? Do you think that men will have had this time where they have been more present in the home and more present in the children's lives do you think that will make a lot more people realize actually this is better this is this is where i should be as well and do you think it will have helped the situation or do you think we'll all just go back exactly the same as how we were i don't think anything's changed at all i think all the statistics are showing all the research all the studies are showing that women have just been more burdened over lockdown well not women mothers have been more burdened over lockdown because they've had all the their usual duties and their job and their fucking homeschooling to do at the same time so i don't think anything i think if anything we've regressed mm. i think there's been a lot of there's a huge amount of pressure that's come along with with the past you know five six months for all sorts of things um, and I think you know, there's more pressure if if you have an employer or, or work, you know, in an environment where the kind of flexible working attitude was not accepted, 
then how it's not going to be any better now you know because mm -hmm. you have to prove yourself all the time and prove yourself even when there's you know the house is full of kids or you know someone is something he's doing or whatever so actually I, I think you know there's going to be a, a huge amount of um anxiety actually that comes with you know having to do your job um and prove that you're doing your job you know from yeah. home so i think for some companies they've absolutely embraced you know flexible working and understand you know that there are benefits to it and it's worked for them but not it doesn't work for every industry and every individual yeah. Um, so yeah I, I don't know I, to be honest I, i'm not sure if it's a good thing or not really at the minute we will i was see. really hopeful at the beginning i was i was really hopeful that you know because we've growth traffic has had flexible working for well since since we started and, and i was really hopeful that the rest of the world was going to catch up with us and realize that you can do it this way and everybody doesn't have to be in an office from nine to five um but then i was i was in a meeting with a, a man who worked at a bank and he was saying like this is it's just gone on long enough we need to get everybody back in the office and i said well you know you can't get everybody back in the office at the moment because it's the school holidays what are people supposed to do? well that's their problem they've got to sort out childcare just like they sorted out childcare childcare beforehand we need people back in the office and business back to work and you're yeah, like you know yeah. how how can people have gone through it? yeah it's what the people have learned nothing learned absolutely nothing <laughs> we're just i honestly i can't remember when i think we had this conversation over whatsapp or something a few weeks ago and um, people like society doesn't change unless there's a really fucking good reason at the top for society to change economical or political or social like Society doesn't change from the bottom up, it's a shame, but can I lay some facts mm -hmm. on you? Lay some facts on us, go. Right, so surprisingly, um, she said sarcastically, the gender pay gap is wider, uh, is, is wider and narrow depending on the sector. So who would like to have a little guess at which sector has the smallest gender pay gap? Oh, okay. Um I think perhaps uh, education. No. I was going to go for medical, so like nursing, stuff like that. Oh, yeah, no. maybe. Sales and customer service coming in at 4.4%. Da 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 da. I do like to guess which has the, so I think broader, like it's not yeah. particularly. Um, sectors but like occupations so which has got the highest gender pay gap or oh, finance no me mds if, if we're talking just roles within the businesses is it not like those that are at the top whatever you want to call it close but no cigar no it's skilled trade occupations at 22.4 percent really so what you mean like plumbers and teach and uh yeah uh, technicians and rickies yeah. yeah that's yeah. interesting isn't it so why because a lot of those are self-employed so i wonder why that's happening yeah probably because um there aren't that many women and the women that are in there are trainees or something um number two process plant and machine operatives 18.1 percent and then third is managers, directors, and senior officials at fifteen point nine percent, which is a couple of percent lower than the than the national average for the gender yeah. pay gap. I think that's it. Ah. I think that that taps into exactly what this conversation is about it being gender pay gap as opposed to being equal pay. It's a very yeah. different thing, isn't it? And the fact is, I guess that you know it's it's only only now that conversations are being had. You know that with. Um, females girls whatever that you can do these roles you can be a bricker you can be a sparky you can do all the same things um you know and there's there's definitely that kind of space there as well for you know tech um and all the stuff that comes with that uh, stem in general you know it's still unusual um, though isn't it i uh, i had a friend who became uh, she worked as a bt technician yeah. um and this is quite a few years ago she i think she was the only bt trainee and mm -hmm. uh, she did the thing you know to climb the climb the um climb the greasy poles climb the telegraph poles with those yeah. hawk things that, like, <laughs> the in the that sounds disgusting yeah, that's, 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 
Pole, pole dancing of a different kind. <laughs> but she was the only one. And I mean, we are only talking. It was probably five, six, seven years ago. But she was the only girl in her entire training cohort year um, that, that BT were employing as a technician. And still, I mean, we put something on the Seroptimist, just to get a Seroptimist in there. I haven't mentioned them yet. And on their Facebook page the other day about the, it was one of the first all-female um fire brigade team oh, so there's five, yeah. five women in the in the fire engine i mean my friend kirsty she's been a firefighter oh, probably about 10 15 years now but again she's she's still quite rare there are not a lot of female firefighters yeah. um and 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 it, it, i mean they put on that post you know you have to see it in order to be it don't you and it, it's like you say if, if you if girls don't see female brickies and female sparkies and female plumbers they just don't think that that's a job for them, do they? Yeah, I mean, we've been having an extension built for the last fucking nine months. I've gestated <laughs> a baby in the time it's taken to get this sunny kitchen done. And, and we've had like loads and loads of tradespeople through and at every level, you know, kind of project managers down to people that whose job it is to carry the bucket. And literally every, every single one of them has been a bloke, every single one. Right. Elaine's commenting. Hello, Elaine. Elaine's Hi, just Elaine. commenting that, uh, that she knows some some female trans people. So there yeah. we go. So they are out there. They are out there. Oh, um, yeah. I, I, we are it's kind of coming up to time. Yeah, just true. quick. Sorry, go on, Rachel. What were you saying? No, I, maybe, maybe it's it's a discussion for another day. But like that, the for me as well. There's also um, you know there's there's other capabilities. It might be. Um, yeah, inappropriate to say, I guess, really. But you know, if I was, if I needed to be rescued from a, a burning building, you know, who the hell is going to lift me? Do you know what I mean? And, and let's be honest, you know, it's, it's going to have to be, a, you know, uh, somebody that can, you know, ha has got the training, got the skills. It doesn't have to be male or female. I don't really care as long as I can get out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think maybe that's that's another thing is, you know, am I capable of doing this? You know, and it's yeah. there's all sorts of other questions that come along with that. Uh, well, this is it because when so Kirsty, my friend Kirsty, who's a firefighter, right? She, you know, when you're at school and they ask you what you're going to be, and we had to put on the wall like what we all wanted to be, and I, I was like going to be the prime minister, and you know, my friend Kerry was going to work for NASA or something, and Kirsty put on, I want to be a three day adventure and a firefighter, and we all laughed at her. We were like, don't be stupid, you know. She was five foot nothing. She she was skinny as anything. She was this tiny, tiny little Kirsty. We were like, you can't be a firefighter. And she is now a firefighter and a three-day eventer so you know Kirsty's had the last bloody laugh the rest of us are all cock arsing around doing nothing that we planned today <laughs> but, but yeah you know the, they, the rules changed and it's, as you say as long as you can do the training as long as you you know you can pass the lift the big hose pipes and uh, and wear the gear although PPE and all that this, pole. Yeah, yeah. exactly that that. I, I, there's no way in this Fucking earth, you would get me up a telegraph pole in any way, shape, or form, right? I think it's, that's the issue here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. No, no. And, yeah, I know. Or, or running into a grease uh, into a greasy building. Looking <laughs> 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 all over the place. Grease on the brain at the moment. Hey, catch me! Hey, catch me! Guys and family again. <laughs> oh my god yeah but there you go it's thrown so uh we quickly because we're coming up to time um so uh oh yes so elaine is saying actually yeah that that her dad used to be a firefighter he did he was he was uh, at the bake-up station there was a firefighter so yeah she's saying how much it's changed and more about fire prevention so yeah. that's why i presume that more women were allowed to come in i know that they lowered the the height the minimum height restrictions and the weight restrictions and stuff so that they could get more women in uh, but anyway um there is a there is a supposed rumor that the the gender pay gap is going to go backwards in terms of the progress we've made over the last few years which admittedly has been at a snail's pace because they have scrapped the requirement to submit gender pay gap statistics for companies you know uh, and every company over 250 employees had to submit their gender pay gap stats uh, for the last kind of two years and because of covid they've said this year you don't have to do that do we think again that that will um that without that kind of accountability and pressure on businesses to improve that again we'll take a step backwards no i don't think reporting is fair anyway from um what i've looked into it reporting is 
you know you can quite easily say well this is why we pay them less they have the less experience they have less you know fewer um quals or whatever i think there's some sectors where it's very easy to sit them side by side and say this is a big problem like in the arts and entertainment industry i think you know they sit side by side literally on a sofa presenting the same program and one is paid this and one is paid that i think that's quite easy but i think generally speaking it's it's almost uh i don't think you can particularly look at individual companies i think this data becomes interesting when you're looking at the broader like we said at the beginning the kind of broader picture and how it reflects society as a whole rather than the job for job comparison mm -hmm. yeah yeah for sure what do you think marisha do you think we're going to get better or do you think we're going to get worse um I don't, I don't know. Well. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's it's more a uh, yeah. It's the reporting's bollocks anyway. Really, you know. Yeah. It's it's what I mean. Okay, yeah. Even if you look at companies over two hundred and fifty people, I mean, what the fuck? The how many companies have got less than that? You know, yeah. they're not being reported on. They're doing whatever they want. You know, so, and that's actually most of the businesses in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. You know, it's, it's still a very small um, snapshot of how things are. Um, I think you know it's it's just going to take conversation and for 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 all genders to raise the bar, quite frankly, uh, for for everybody and you know for it to you know people to be able to get into you know and to be yeah to be flexible enough to to be able to get into you know senior roles and different roles you know and, and it's pure acceptance is what it comes down. Yeah. To. Absolutely, yeah. and I think yeah the the emphasis has got to be on changing that culture so that men are empowered to take their paternity leave so that men are, you know it's not just women doing the care roles it falls equally on men and women and then only then will we be able to have equality of roles in the workplace and then equality of pay um and i think despite the fact that the gender pay gap has now uh, sorry the equal pay act has now been in place for 50 years we don't seem to be all that further forward on that point of view do we and that's a cheery note to end the uh, end the session on. There we go. It's all shit. It's been shit for fifty years, and it's getting worse. Yeah. <laughs> Join us next yeah. week. <laughs> I don't know what we're discussing next week. What are we discussing yeah, next we week? Yeah, we do know what we're doing next week. Yes. Hang on, we've yes. done a plan. We've done an actual plan. Yeah. We're talking that's about it. the glass ceiling. The glass ceiling, yes, because it depends where. Yeah, you're going to be. Uh, you're going to be on mat leave, aren't you, Hannah? So. Who knows? Uh, who knows? But yeah, glass ceiling next next Monday, three o'clock. Please join us then. If you have any comments or any questions that you'd like to ask him, please put them in the comments.